she led the pro-independent Scottish National Party to win 56 seats in the United Kingdom Parliament in London. Nicola Sturgeon wants Edinburgh to have a greater say in EU affairs. James Franey talked to her in the European capital. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, thanks very much for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, UK Prime Minister David Cameron himself has been on a whistle-stop tour of Europe. Here you are in Brussels. What brings you here? What do you hope to achieve? Well, I was making a speech this morning at the European Policy Centre and in that speech I was setting out what I consider to be the positive and overwhelming case for the UK and as part of that Scotland to remain a member of the European Union. And I want very much in the period running up to the UK's in-out referendum for people outside of the UK to hear that there are voices in favour of the UK staying in Europe. Not because it's perfect, I was also setting out some areas of reform that I think uh, would be sensible, but Scotland and the UK's economic interests, I think our social and cultural interests, lead me to the conclusion that we are far better off being members of the European Union and arguing for that reform from within. What can you realistically expect to achieve when EU relations remain a competence for Westminster? Well, it's no secret that I would love that to be different. I wanted Scotland to vote yes to independence last year, but we, we didn't do that. And therefore, what I'm seeking to achieve is a louder voice for Scotland at Westminster, but also in the European Union. So the proposals for further devolution that will shortly be considered by the Westminster Parliament touch on areas of Scottish government influence and role within European decision making and more particularly within the formulation of UK decision making that then feeds into European decision making. I think we should have a much stronger and more formal role in the development of the UK position on matters before uh, European Union. I think uh, where a UK minister is not able to lead a council meeting a Scottish Government Minister, if we have devolved responsibility in the area, should lead. We've had circumstances in the past where Scottish Government Ministers on fishing, for example, have had to sit quietly while a civil servant leads discussions at a council meeting. That's wrong. So there are ways in which... But eventually, I mean, the UK is the member of the EU, it's not Scotland. I, I accept that. You know, it's not the position I wanted to be the case, but I accept that's the mm. position we're in. But, you know, the whole point of devolution is to give uh, Scotland and other devolved nations within the UK a louder voice and more influence and I want to see Scotland take that opportunity um, both at a UK level and within the European Union. And I have to say the people I speak to when I come to Brussels are very open to hearing more of the Scottish voice. So i just go um, specifically into what David Cameron's looking for. Um, it's often said that he's not laid out what he wants but in fact he has in a number of speeches over the past few years. Um, do you think EU migrants should be able to claim in-work benefits if they've been living in the UK for less than four years? Well, I think there is a case, and I said this today, uh, for looking at how we change the rules and regulations around benefit entitlement to further crack down on abuse. But I think when you try to go beyond that to fundamentally undermine the freedom of movement, then that takes you into so you would oppose that. territory. I, I'm yet to be convinced of, of that. There are already uh, rules in place in terms of uh, habitual residence, right to reside tests, you know, periods for entitlement. Um, so yes, I think there are ways in which we should uh, look at how we tighten those rules to crack down on abuse and I guess there would be a lot of support for that in other countries but freedom of movement surely is a fundamental principle of the European Union and we benefit from it because mm. many people from Scotland other parts of the UK go to other European countries to live and to work. Do you think we should strip out a reference to ever closer union in the EU treaties? Um, I, I think that is focusing on something that is you know rhetoric rather than... It's what Mr Cameron wants. Well I don't have to agree with everything Mr Cameron wants and I think he's yet to set out why that is so fundamentally important. You know, the UK is not in the Euro. I support the fact it's not in the Euro. I wouldn't support an independent Scotland going into the Euro. So in a sense, you know, we have the, the practical manifestation of not, you know, going down every road to ever closer union that might have been envisaged when those words were written. Why, you know, you need a treaty change to uh, underline that is less obvious. And I think the danger David Cameron is getting himself into is he's putting up these big, you know, issues of principle that probably he can't deliver, that then makes it much harder for him to argue the positive case for EU membership. Should non-Eurozone countries have a say in decisions affecting only the Eurozone? I think there is uh, not just a case for it, I think there is inevitably going to be a direction of travel towards greater governance of the Eurozone by 
Eurozone countries. I, I think that, and, and to some extent, that is one of the logical conclusions of much of the UK's position. What the UK sometimes appears to present as if it wants, though, is to have its cake and eat it. It doesn't want to be in the Eurozone, uh, but it wants to continue to have influence in the decisions that govern it. And these, are, you know, these are complex discussions, and countries will have to judge and assess and reassess their national interest in all of these discussions. But, uh, you know, I, I think one of the problems, and you said people know what David Cameron wants, um, in maybe very, very broad terms, that's true. But there is a lack of detail and definition around that that I don't think is helping the debate right now. Should we stop migrants claiming child benefits for dependents living outside the but UK? Again, I mean, that's one of the examples of where there may well be and is a case to look at sensible changes uh, that are about cracking down on abuse. These are, uh, you know, issues where I think there is a case for, for discussing making changes. Uh, but I guess my almost philosophical difference of opinion with David Cameron here is I think it's better to approach these issues and try to get consensus uh, from a position of collaboration rather than doing what the UK government is appearing to do just now, which is stamp its feet and, you know, sort of threaten to throw all of its toys out of the pram if it doesn't get its own way. Could you explain this double majority which you're proposing? It's quite simple. The, the UK is not a unitary state. It's a multinational state. And during the debate on Scottish independence, we were told that each nation of the UK had an equal voice and mm. would be listened to. Now, if that's true, and I hope that those saying that did mean that, then it surely would be wrong for Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland to be taken out of Europe, even if we vote to stay in, just because England has got the much bigger population and can effectively outvote us. So a double majority arrangement. Is it democratic? Uh, well, let me finish explaining what it is, and then I'll explain why absolutely it's democratic. Would the double majority, and th these kind of arrangements are commonplace in federal systems, uh, would mean that the UK could only come out if England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland voted to come out of each of the component parts of the UK. Now, that's more democratic than one country being taken out against its will. But it's a referendum on British membership of the EU, not the individual country. But Britain is not a unitary state, or the United Kingdom, to be precise about the, the member state, is not a unitary state. And, you know, anybody who wants to argue that it is right that Scotland, even if we voted to stay in, or indeed Wales or Northern Ireland, should, regardless of that, end up outside of the European Union, given all the consequences that would have for jobs and investment and our society, our very sense of who we are, um, I think is, are, are the ones arguing uh, an undemocratic case. But you would essentially be vetoing, say, the rest of the, of the, of the countries voted well, you know, to I, I put forward a case last year in the Scottish independence referendum that Scotland should be a member state of the European Union in its own right. That's not what is happening. We've got to recognise the nature of the United Kingdom. It's not a unitary state. It's a multinational state. And you know, if you want to be a multinational state that genuinely allows the voice of all of the nations within it to be heard, then you have to accept sometimes that, you know, these compromises have to be made. It would be fundamentally undemocratic for Scotland to find itself at the exit door of the European Union if we had, in a referendum, voted to stay in the European Union.